yet another example of Gibson just not giving a single shit. Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of the highest quality woven guitar, bag, and camera straps you'll ever see. Native Sons straps are handmade one at a time in the USA with unparalleled love and care. Click the link in the description to check out their new expanded lineup featuring all new 3-inch guitar straps. And remember, when you support my sponsor, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. Hey y'all, it's Shit Post Friday. Hey there, lads and ladies. Brad the Guitar is just here. It is time once again for Shit Post Friday. First up is Shit Post Friday. As always, I like to get the sad news out of the way. And this week, we learned of the passing of longtime Little Feet guitarist Paul Barrere. Paul had been a guitarist for the band since 1973. No official cause of death has been cited, but Paul did suffer from liver cancer and also hepatitis C for a long time. He was 71 years old. Uh, rest in peace, Paul, and God bless his family. On to the real big story this week Gibson has lost yet another one of its trademarks apparently in the EU there is an authority that rules on such things and they have ruled that Gibson cannot have a trademark on its uh, Firebird shape that it's had since the 1960s and only bothered to trademark in 2011. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that this cancellation division of the EU Intellectual Property Office has given for retracting the uh, trademark. Interestingly, you know, we re-reported back in June, they'd also lost the trademark to their Flying V. Uh, that was actually in a court case and that was upon appeal. So Gibson actually had appealed the same decision by the same body in the Flying V case and they lost that case in court. So I'm wondering whether or not they're gonna continue to appeal this stuff in the EU or they're just gonna, you know, cut their losses and run because you know, I mean, honestly, it feels like maybe throwing good money after bad if you're trying, you know, if the Flying V doesn't pass, you know, there's no way that, that the Firebird's going to pass either. So, I mean, if I were you guys, I would just cut my losses. I don't think a court case is going to do you much good if the Flying V case is any indicator. So, that, I mean, that this will be the second major Gibson shape that will have been lost in the EU recently. And the plaintiff in both of these cases, the one who brought it forth, has been the same. So the application to cancel this trademark came from Hans Peter Wilfer, who is the founder and owner of Warwick and Framus Guitars. You know, so that's pretty interesting. I don't know if Warwick plans to build Firebird-like shapes, or if Framus plans to do the same, or, you know, Flying V shapes. But, I mean, certainly I guess they can now. This news also comes on the heels of a July report uh, from Guitar.com. And Guitar.com, by the way, has been very good in reporting on this Gibson stuff and all this trademark infringement stuff. I urge you guys to go uh, bookmark Guitar.com. Great website. Uh, the reporting is always very stellar over there. But uh, this report back in July from them also, we reported on this channel, or actually on Channel 2 we reported it, that the ES-335 trademark is also going to face a stiff legal battle coming up. This is, however, going to be in a U.S. court. So we'll continue to follow that story as well as it develops, which could be huge. Also on a related story, if you guys have been watching this channel with any regularity for any length of time, you already understand and know about Gibson's troubles over the past uh, few years, and namely, you know, when they cl had to close their Memphis factory, you know, and the whole bankruptcy and everything that came later, and then, you know, we found out about them crushing all those guitars with a end loader, and all, you know, all the things that have befallen Gibson. I thought this was kind of interesting, too, because it's just kind of the final nail in the coffin on the whole uh, Memphis factory factory closing thing. Apparently this uh, group from Mississippi who are uh, museum conservationists uh, were contacted by FedEx. Now FedEx is the current occupant of the downtown building there in Memphis that once housed the Gibson factory that made all their ES-335 and other hollow body instruments. Uh, well they contacted this group from Mississippi and said hey look we've got We've got this stuff, I guess drywall, that had been cut off the wall where all these artists who had come into Gibson's factory, that they had signed the wall. You know, all these famous artists had signed the wall over the years, and they so they had these cut side of the wall where they were remodeling and they said, we're going to throw this stuff in the dumpster if you guys don't want it because Gibson left it all behind. I mean... 
A group from Mississippi is working to save a big piece of Memphis music history. They're preserving famous signatures on the walls of the old Gibson Guitar Building. Yeah, this is pretty neat. The building downtown, as you may know, will turn into FedEx Logistics Headquarters. Fox 13's Jackie Massey is live in Southeast Memphis tonight. Jackie, you spoke with the group about how they got the opportunity to do this. It was pretty cool. I spoke to one man. He's with the Delta Blues Museum Board, and he tells me that a contact with FedEx offered him the memorabilia. And he didn't want the signatures and the signs from the Gibson Guitar Factory to be thrown out during construction. This is the Gibson sign. It's just pieces parts. It's an old neon sign that we brought out. Jim Herring drove from Clarksdale, Mississippi to Memphis to save signs and signatures written on the wall at the Gibson Guitar Factory. A board member of the Delta Blues Museum, Herring tells me a contact from FedEx asked if he would like the memorabilia. I said, Jim, they're going to get rid of this stuff. These are some pictures. If you want it, go up there and get it. If not, they're going to throw it away. The building is under construction to turn into the new FedEx Logistics headquarters. Herring was surprised to see signatures from famous musicians like Alice Cooper and Bobby Blue Bland. It's a lot of history. There's a lot of names that are written on that board in there where people have picked up guitars. He says he would like to see the memorabilia in the Delta Blues Museum, but says his main focus is on preserving everything. Museums are... Um, they preserve our history, and it's up to us to keep, you know, to hang on to whatever we can. Yet another example of Gibson just not giving a single shit, you know, about their own heritage. You know, they claim it to be all about heritage and history and all this stuff, but then they just leave something like this behind in their old factory. And not only that, but they left, you know, all their signs, uh, all their big Gibson signage and, you know, big neon awesome signs, you know, saying Gibson. They didn't even bother to grab any of that and move it to... Tennessee or you know try to preserve it or salvage it in any way you know it, it takes it takes FedEx you know to call somebody and say hey we were gonna throw this away but we don't feel right about throwing it away okay so FedEx doesn't feel right about throwing it away why would Gibson feel right about leaving it behind or throwing it away you know what I mean it's just like the very people the very people you would expect to care about this shit obviously don't give a fuck <laughs> you know what I mean? But somebody from FedEx cares enough to try to preserve the stuff and contact somebody to come get it. You know, I just it just blows my freaking mind. You know what I mean? And it just shows shows me honestly, Gibson just doesn't care. I mean, they're, they're just they've got their head down. I guess they're building guitars. You know, and it's not the fault of the people in the factory. You know, I'm sure the people who worked at that Men Memphis factory would have loved to have some of these mementos too. You know, of the time that they spent it at Gibson. You know, working there. But no, you know, they can't take any of this stuff home, and Gibson just doesn't give a shit about it. You know, what do they do? They take a bunch of stuff out of the factory. The only thing that they did do out of that factory was they took a bunch of Firebirds, and they, they ran over them with an end loader. I mean, I just don't get it, man. You know, it just, it just doesn't end. The bad news just does not end for this company. It's a shit show of a company. It really is. I, I mean, what, what the f*** else can you say about it? I, I, I used to love Gibson, man. You know, growing up, I loved Gibsons. I used to always want a Gibson. You know, I, and I've owned a shit ton of Gibsons. I, I could probably sit here for the next half hour just showing you guys photographs that I have on my hard drive of all the Gibsons that I've owned over the years and flipped and sold and made, you know, made good money on. And some of the Gibsons I still own, you know. I could sit here and show you stuff. But it's... But why bother? You know, why would I want to promote this company any more than I... I have in the past you know what I mean I just don't I don't see it and then you know you talk about preservation check this story out right here we've got a situation here where it's just to just to contrast it you know here we've got Martin guitars goes out of their way to donate a kiln that was a wood drying kiln that they had in their factory apparently every so often they upgrade you know this the the machines and stuff in their factory and they had this kiln that they weren't going to use and i mean we're talking about a kiln the size of a fucking room here a giant kiln you know not something that's that all that easy to move around and yet they donate this kiln to university of kentucky thank you thank you so much martin guitars for actually giving a shit and not taking the kiln out out in the back, you know, by the dumpster and blowing the son of a bitch up or something. You know what I mean? It's like, had it been Gibson's kiln, that's what they would have done. They would have poked holes in it and sunk it in the fucking ocean just so nobody else could use the kiln. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that would be Gibson. That's Gibson. But thank you. 
thank Christ for, for companies like Martin who actually give a shit about the environment, give a shit about, you know, uh, edu higher education. You know, they're going to pass along this this ability to learn more about wood and drying wood and you know how it all works to the University of Kentucky uh, a university not far from me and in my home state thank you so much Martin I will support you for that you know what I mean you just created some goodwill there but it, had it been Gibson you know they would just taken it out back by the dumpster and probably shot holes in it or something <laughs> It's just, what, do you, what else are you supposed to take away from this kind of contrast? But, you know, speaking of the big companies, here we have another story of Fender. And in this uh, case, Fender is claiming, or has claimed in an interview with uh, Guitar.com, uh, that the average guitar player will spend $10,000 in their lifetime on gear. This is in a, uh, an interview with Andy Mooney, uh, Fender CEO, over on Guitar.com. And once again, great reporting from Guitar.com. Good interview. I encourage you guys to go to their website and definitely bookmark their page. But yeah, you know, he's like, uh, just kind of like, yeah, if we can if we can keep these uh, new players, if we can get them in, you know, in, really into guitar to the point where they learn and they keep playing and don't just give it up after a few months, then, you know, over their lifetime, they will spend uh, an average of $10,000, he claims. But I have to, you know, I, I question that number because, I mean, in all honesty, I've probably spent, <laughs> I've probably spent a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but, I mean, if you count... I mean, of course, I run a business, so that's a little bit different. But it, but if uh, if you were to add it all up for me, I'm an out, I'm an outlier, granted. But uh, yeah, hundreds of thousands of dollars probably and stuff at this point. Um, but I mean, what would you guys reckon that you have spent on music gear? I'd be really interested to to know this. Like, just give it, give me a roundabout ballpark figure. What would be the figure that you think that you have spent over your lifetime on music gear? You know, I mean, you got to think. Every time you buy an American Fender, you know, you're looking at about a grand. You know, I mean, even uh, the lowest end American Gibsons at this point, well, like, a le you know, are approaching a grand. And not, not to mention amplifiers. You know, I mean, it's just, what do you think, and accessories. What do you think you have spent in your lifetime on music gear? I'd like to hear about, about this below. I'm just curious to kind of collate this information from you know all of my audience and see what everybody has spent. It would be really interesting to see some of the figures. Uh, but I do question the ten thousand dollar average thing because I think it just seems like a number he pulled out of his ass. So also in the past week or so, a couple of subscribers to this channel and also a couple of channels that I subscribe to uh, have appeared in the guitar news. Uh, so I want to congratulate them. First of all, Scar My Guitar uh, is both a subscriber to this channel and I also uh, return the subscription. But they have been featured in a GuitarWorld.com article. Uh, it says here, they're being compared in this article to uh, MTV's Pimp My Ride for guitars. So that's really cool. Congratulations to Scar My Guitar. Also, congratulations to uh, Big D's Guitars. I believe he's a subscriber to this channel, but I also subscribe to his channel. So I uh, want to congratulate him too. He appeared in this uh, gu Guitar World article as well about his whiskey barrel top. Uh, custom tele style guitars so that's pretty cool he's got these tele style guitars where he's using the the barrel tops for like maker's mark uh, wild turkey and jim beam and other kentucky distilleries so there's a bit more kentucky news there for you in connection with guitar this week also i thought this was kind of interesting and just really funny this dude in in new quay i guess that's how you pronounce that new quay cornwall in uh england in the south of england this dude is out on his surfboard uh playing bass guitar on his surfboard now this is something that you might expect to see some crazy californian do but this dude is doing it off the coast of cornwall in england at this time of year and if you look up the I mean, if you look up the uh, weather this time of year, I mean, it's like 54 degrees Fahrenheit. It's windy, rainy, nasty, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's it's England, so, I mean, it's... This dude's probably freezing his balls off out there, but he's uh, he's out there playing his bass and surfing. How cool is that? But, yeah, that will do it for the news. <laughs> All right, we haven't done an Ask an Amp Tech in a couple weeks, so I thought we would do some. Ask an amp tech. When you don't know what the fuck you'll do when you for asking an amp tech. Uh, okay, first up in ask, ask, 
Okay, first up in Ask an Amp Tech, we have uh, Tyler Williams, and he says he's got a Marshall DSL 100. It's only four months old, first of all, works just fine. And then uh, when he first turned it on tonight, a few minutes later, nothing but a faint sound coming out of it. Uh, he changed the power. He's saying he changed the power, comma, fuse, and double checked all the connections. I'm guessing he changed the power fuse, but why would you change the power fuse? Was the fuse blown? Uh, if the fuse was blown and then you changed it and it's still having the same problem, uh, then something else something else is going on that caused that fuse to blow. But if you just changed the fuse thinking, oh, you don't have the test equipment to test the fuse and you weren't sure if it was blown, uh, then you know it might not be related to that at all. But it could just be a, a tube issue. It's what it sounds like to me. It just could be a tube issue. You, you say you plugged it into another amp. <clears throat> With the same cab and the and it and the cab works fine, the cables work fine and everything. So if you've eliminated all that stuff and it is the amp, I mean that could be a lot of different things, honestly. But I would try tubes first because that's the thing that is the the easiest uh, for a novice to check. You know, and the way you do that, I would get just one good preamp uh, tube, and then just start at the first tube and substitute that in at that spot, substitute it into the next spot, and just on down the line. And that's a good way to troubleshoot. That's why you should always have one or two known good tubes on hand. Uh, maybe a, a, a set of a good known output tubes also on hand is always a good idea. Although in this case, I mean, if you've blown something else and that has caused one of your tubes to blow, uh, you know, particularly your output tubes, because that's where the highest voltages are in the amp, uh, you could just put a, no, a new set of tubes in there and then just blow new tubes too. So, um, you know, really, you probably want to take it to a tech, but just just preliminarily from what you're telling me, it sounds like it could be a tube issue and you might luck out and it could be a preamp tube. So get yourself a good 12x7 and do what I said, cycle that through and see if that helps you. So good luck with that. This next question is from Michael Bro. He says, uh, good morning. I have a Vibrosonic that I finished recapping. It was originally blowing fuses and then after the recap, it whistles. Here's how it appears. Power on, standby on, two or three seconds, then it starts whistling. I'm guessing you mean the standby is like the amp is in ready to go mode. It should be it should be playing. I'm guessing that's what you mean by standby on. Uh, two or three seconds, it starts whistling. Swapped a number of preamp tubes around and tap tested them. Uh, please help and thanks. When you tap tested them, what what? Um, I would have to ask what you know what happened after that. Actually, wait, that's old. That's old. <laughs> you sent me this back in February. I guess I didn't get back with you. Sorry about that, man. <laughs> anyway, I hope you fixed your problem. <laughs> but yeah, I'm 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 pretty certain. Usually, when you get whistling like that, um, it's usually something to do with preamp tubes or something in the preamp. Uh, so you know, hopefully, you were able to solve that issue. But yeah, what was interesting about uh, your newest message to me was was this. You said you don't know how you figured this out, but here's an idea to catch our rat, our pack rat junk parts. Yeah, very interesting idea. And I, also they're stackable. I'd never really thought about that, but this is a great idea. Yeah, if you guys are looking for a good storage solution, a very cheap storage solution, in fact, ice trays. Very good idea. Also ice trays. That would be a good thing to have like sitting out on your bench, your workbench. Uh, to put your parts in, you know, different different parts, uh, different screws. You know, if you're if you're disassembling something in particular, you know, to have something there where you can separate all the parts out and maybe even organize them like one, two, three, four, five. You know, so you know exactly what order things went go back in. That that's a very good idea. Very interesting. It's uh, good to, good to be able to pass this stuff along. Okay, this email is from Eddie K. Okay, Eddie K writes, uh, Brad, I just picked up my second AO35 in immaculate condition for guitar amp conversion. If you guys aren't aware, I have converted uh, some AO35 Hammond organ amplifiers into smoking hot guitar amplifiers in the past. I'll put a link up here if you guys want to go check one of those out. But that's what he's referring to when he says AO35. Uh, but anyway, he says there are so many different and conflicting versions of how to convert this online and your version as evidenced by your demo and final build is by far the best sounding and uh, most straightforward of the conversions. So I'm relying on your video to pull this off, but there are a couple of things that were skipped over and I'm trying my darndest to piece it all together and I still can't 
make it clear. Can you help, please? Just a little clarification. I've installed the cord fuse switch, volume tone pots, and tone stack, uh, quarter inch jacks for input and speaker out. First question. I'm about to add the shielded cable from the input jack to the first tube pin. Uh, pin 1 or pin 6? Question mark. It doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter, man. You can put it in whichever one you want, but uh, whichever one they were using as the first stage originally is probably the one you should go with. Um, I can't remember which one I used, but it's going to go to one of those. Obviously, it'll be... Uh, you know, it'll be one of the grids. So, put put it in uh, uh, whichever grid, uh, whichever pin was hooked up to the uh, RCA jack originally. That's the one you want to put it in. Uh, question number two: Where is the fuse connected? Okay, so to answer this part of the question, I want to uh, I want to do it this way, uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, the black wire that comes in off the power cord, you can see here the power cord that's coming into the amplifier. You have three uh, cords. You have a black, white, and a green. Uh, over here you have a terminal and a switch. Uh, the ter this terminal was actually already in the amplifier. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the case, that this was already in the amplifier. So there's actually three terminals on this little terminal strip. Um, the black wire that comes in, that's your hot wire. And in this case, I decided to take the black wire directly to the on-off switch. And the reason for that is because there really wasn't a great spot for a, um, for a fuse holder that was accessible from the outside. So I ended up using this inline fuse holder. And the thing about using the inline fuse holder is it really is not all that conducive to uh, having the line come in and go directly to the fuse first because then you got you kind of got the fuse just flopping around in there on with just one leg attached uh, securely to something you know so it, instead of that state of affairs I decided it would be better really to have it go to the switch first usually I wouldn't do it that way but in this case I, I sent it to the switch first uh, so it goes uh, out the other side of the switch uh, to this little inline fuse holder. Uh, I believe there's like a, I don't know, one and a half or two amp fuse, something like that inside of there. And then it goes to uh, this terminal, uh, which goes to one half of the transformer. Of course, it goes, you know, through or goes through the power transformer. Winding uh, primary comes out, goes to here. Second one. Whoops. Goes to there and uh, back out through the neutral or white wire. And then, of course, you've got the green wire that's going to the ground lug right there that was already provided for you, which was kind of convenient. So this was really a convenient little terminal, and it was a good a good spot to put the switch, and they're all everything's side by side. Now, you could probably, if you wanted to... Um, uh, you know, I mean, you could probably find somewhere to, to stick a fuse, but the problem was the fuse holders are pretty deep. So if you tried to go in the back here, it was going to butt up again, real close against this uh, transformer casing and I, the bell. And I didn't want that to happen. So I decided just, this was actually safer, I thought, than trying to do that. So that explains why I did it that way. <laughs> okay, this isn't strictly... Uh... This isn't strictly asking Amtech, but it did appear in my email, so I thought I would share it with you guys. Uh, Michael Smith sent me this photograph, uh, and this is the censored version of this photograph. A bunch of choral guitars. Of course, I reported a, a week or two back about the death of Vincent Bell, who was the inventor who invented the choral uh, sitar and had a you know a bunch of. Uh, uh, signature models under the coral name that were built by Dan Electro back in the 1960s. But I just thought this was a really, really fun, fun picture from uh, the 1960s. A lot of, you know, pretty ladies. I don't know why he's got, why does he have their um, faces blocked out anyway? I'm not sure on that one. But they're all holding these coral guitars. Is this like an official coral guitar photo shoot? <laughs> because every, sing every one of them have, have coral guitars. That's super interesting. I would be interested. Uh, I didn't ask you, I guess, but <laughs> but I would be interested to know the source of that photograph.
All right, guys, that will do it for Ship Post Friday. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Hit subscribe down below if you have. Uh, also, subscribe over to Channel 2. I put a lot of stuff over there. Uh, I don't typically put on Channel 1. Also, a lot of bonus material ends up over on Channel 2 as well. So, uh, I've been putting a lot of stuff over there of late. And, uh, yeah, it's been doing very well, actually. Also, I hope everybody had a happy Halloween. And for now, we'll see you all later.